Hello, friends. This is Scott Pauley, and I'm thrilled you've joined us for the Weekend Pulpit. From time to time, it's my privilege to share a Bible message that God has used to affect my life in a unique way. And today's message from God's Word is from a guest preacher and someone that is very special to me. I hope you'll get your Bible and follow along as we listen for the Lord to speak to our hearts. Ephesians chapter 3, and tonight we are continuing our study of the book of Ephesians, richer, deeper, stronger, and we are indeed rich in the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to anchor our life deeper in Him and in His Word, and we want to have the Lord to physically and spiritually enable us to be strong in the Lord in the power of His might. And we come to one of my favorite verses. It's 6.20 Central Standard Time and probably at this point um, one of my pastors um, I made a post about it last evening. One of my, uh, one of my pa- mentors, role models, Pastor Roger Pauley after 33 years and three months by now, uh, he, he, may be, he may be getting his money's worth for his last one, I don't know. But he's probably officially completed his last sermon as pastor of Cranberry Baptist Church after 33 years. And our family was uh, in that ministry for just shy of seven years. And uh, uh, he's actually, we have two, two men, two pastors in our life who are both retiring, Pastor Paulie. Pastor Mike Poole, Bible Baptist in Highland, Indiana, and um, I'm, in, I'm, I'm helped by their example because these are two men who have, uh, as we say, stood by the stuff, and they have honorably served, and uh, to, to have it said of you after, let's see, uh, well, Pastor Paulie, 33 years, Pastor Poole, is it 45 years? 45 um, To to be able to have others say that they served honorably after such a long period of time, to me, is is a a higher accolade than any athletic trophy or or any award that could be given to actors and actresses. And um, I'm praying, uh, you know, for Pastor Pauly, he, um, Cranberry, a little coal community in Beckley, West Virginia, Cranberry was his first pastor and his last pastor. And so I'm praying that I can follow that same pattern and I'm hoping that Harvest is my first pastor. Uh, I got 10 years under my belt and you've got at least, Lord willing, at least another 20, 25 on you. So I'm sorry, I apologize ahead of time. But you, you're stuck. Well, I, don't guess you, I guess you could change that if you wanted, but I'm hoping you don't want to do that. <laughs> I've already uh, had several comments. It may happen Wednesday night when I preach on what the Bible says about alcoholic beverages. I don't know. I may split the church with that one, Brother Dan. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm 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 thankful for the I'm thankful for the influences of my life, and uh, God has been so good to us in that, in that way. Ephesians chapter three. Let's let's just pause a moment. Let's ask the Lord to uh, open our heart to His Word tonight. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. And what an honor, Lord, that you have not only invited us, but you have made it possible that we may speak with you. We realize that you you know what we need before we ever utter the first word of our prayer. You tell us in your word, as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And we're thankful for your care as our heavenly father. Lord, we, we have a real problem. We all 
We all know the importance of prayer. We all know the command you give us in your word to pray. Father, we, we don't always pray like we ought. Give us, Father, for our prayerlessness. It's no wonder we have so little power in our lives because we don't pray the price. So please teach us tonight as we consider this awesome subject of prayer. And we'll thank you for it because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Just one verse tonight. Lord willing, next Sunday I will consider verses 20 and 21 together because they are together. But I just uh, feel led to focus in on this truth tonight. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And tonight I want to preach to you the subject I've simply entitled The Unimaginable Power of Prayer. The Unimaginable Power of Prayer. In this one verse we have one of the great prayer promises. Perhaps my most favorite of all the prayer promises throughout the Word of God. Prayer is the most important thing that we can do as Christians. Paul wrote to young Timothy in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. He said, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. First of all. Before you preach, before you sing, before you teach a Sunday school lesson, before you clean the bathrooms of the church, before you begin your day to go to work or to go to school, we should make this a priority of our life, to pray. A.J. Gordon said, there is more you can do after you pray, but there is nothing more you can do until you pray. Spurgeon said it like this, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. An old-time preacher, Joe Henry Hankins, had a sermon on the early church, and he said that the early church had one solution to all of their problems. Guess what? Prayer. And you'll find that pattern all throughout the book of Acts. Every time a challenge arose, they prayed. When persecution came, they prayed. When Peter was thought to be in prison and getting ready to be put to death, they all prayed. They prayed solve their issues. Dr. John R. Rice said, all of your failures are prayer failures. It's pretty strong. It means my failures as a preacher, pastor, prayer failure. My failure as a husband, as a father, goes back to prayer failure. One of his sermons, Dr. Curtis Hudson quoted James 4 too. You have not because you ask not. Then he said, one of the most shocking things you'll ever discover is to arrive into heaven and find all the things you could have had, but you never received because you never bothered to ask. The Bible never says men ought always to preach and not to faint. The Bible doesn't say men ought always to win souls and not to faint. Not to sing and not faint, but the Bible says that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Think about it. The Lord Jesus and His disciples who spent many, many, many hours, three years, nearly day and night for three years, with the Lord Jesus Christ. They saw Him heal the sick. They saw Him raise the dead. They saw him make blinded eyes to see, etc., etc. But they never one time said, Lord, teach us to preach like you. They never said, Lord, teach us to perform miracles like you. What did they ask? Lord, teach us to pray. I think in our life we can point to so many issues and challenges that we face and that all goes back to a lack of prayer in our life. Well, this passage, this verse, 
challenges me and encourages my faith to realize the possibility of prayer. And I want us to just kind of walk through this one verse and meditate on it. I'll, I'll give you a little spoiler alert. You know, every year we have a theme that we just try to focus on throughout the year. And, and I really feel even at this point of the year already that next year we're going to make a more of a concentrated effort on prayer and to seek the Lord, Lord willing, more next year with greater emphasis in this area of prayer. Pray first. Don't worry. Don't stress first. Don't fix it first. Pray first. And let's look at this verse and let's just uh, unpack it a little bit. So let's, let's notice... Let me, most of my sermons have three points. I don't know why. It just kind of works that way. I guess that's about all my mind can hold. I had a fourth one this morning and have a headache from it, I guess. I'm just kidding. Let's consider, first of all, tonight, from this verse, the person to whom we're praying. Those three little words that introduce the verse. The first three words of verse 20. Let's say them out loud together. The first three words. Together. Now unto Him. This, I believe, is the secret of powerful prayer. It's not eloquence. It's not having pretty words and a very scripted, formulated prayer that sounds nice to people. It isn't even in long prayers. That's not the secret of prayer. What I believe to be the secret of prayer is the person to whom we are praying. Now let, let's just rehearse some things that we know. We know that when we pray that prayer is not just empty words, right? We know that. Now we can pray with empty words. Jesus warned the Pharisees about repetitious words and, and just going through the motions. We know that prayer is more than just empty, reciting empty words. But when we pray, we are approaching the Almighty God. Now unto Him. This is not a genie in a bottle kind of a situation where we get our Bibles and, and we rub our Bibles three times and, and, and the Lord pops out, a genie pops out and says, you just ask anything and I'll give it to you. No. We are praying unto the God of the universe. Think with me here. Things we know. But just because we know them doesn't mean we pray like we should. Right? We are praying with, now unto Him. We are praying to the one about which Moses wrote in Genesis 1.1. You say, well, um, is Genesis 1.1 a prayer promise? Sure. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If God can form everything out of nothing, then He can answer any prayer that I pray. The angel of the Lord came to Abram and Sarah to inform them that God would give them a child, even in their old age. Remember what, what Sarah did in response? What did she do, church? She laughed. <laughs> oh, this is great. Oh, that's funny. And the angel of the Lord said, this is the great Dowdy version. Why did Sarah laugh? And then the angel of the Lord asked an incredible question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I mean, you, you, Sarah laughed out of lack of unbelief, or lack of belief. She, she laughed because of her unbelief. And she's kind of making a light moment. And the angel of the Lord said, Why are you laughing? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer to that question of course not. The children of Israel found themselves literally between a rock and a hard place. Pharaoh had let them go. He regretted his decision. He gathered his, his best soldiers. They got on their chariots and they chased after them. The children of Israel were at, were at a rock and a hard place. Canyon walls on either side of them. They had the Red Sea in front of them. And they had Pharaoh's army breathing down their back. And God defied Natural law. There's another way to describe it, right? God, if, if Genesis 1-1 is true, and we believe it is, amen, then God has no problem with causing the water to part and form a wall on this side and a wall on this side and a million plus people. When they had nowhere else to turn, 
This God opened a way through the Red Sea and they walked through on dry land. This is the God. Now unto Him, when you pray, this is the person to whom you're praying. Daniel was given the mandate to stop praying. And he was threatened with death if those orders were defied. That death was being thrown into a den of lions. Hungry ones. Even though he knew the consequences, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 6 that Daniel, as his, as his normal custom was, he went to his room, he opened the window to Jerusalem, and he bowed on his knees three times a day. He was arrested, thrown into the den of lions, and God defied logic again. He shut the mouths of those hungry lions, and Daniel, I'm guessing, had a pretty good night's sleep. Don't tell me that God only answered big prayers in Bible times. I refuse to believe it. In the New Testament, we meet a good father by the name of Jairus. His daughter was sick to the point of death. He sent for Jesus. Jesus was on his way. Got met by the woman with the issue of blood. He took care of that problem. By the time Jesus got to their house, she had died. The mourners had already gathered doing their normal routine of mourning, public mourning. And the Lord Jesus went into the room with that little girl and put His hands on her. And He raised her from the dead. What do you think that must have done to that daddy's faith? The Lord Jesus was standing at the mouth of the grave of His friend Lazarus. Four days, He stinks by now. Lazarus, come forth. And he who had been dead four days came walking out of that grave. Listen, the Lord Jesus Himself said, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it again. I'll raise it up. Sure enough, He died. Just like He promised. Three days, three nights later, up from the grave He arose with a mighty triumph over His foes. This is the God, this is the person to whom we are praying. Sometimes our faith needs a little confidence boost, doesn't it? Sometimes we don't see the answers like we want to see them. But let me tell you, this verse reminds us of the person to whom we're praying. No matter how you start your prayer, I, through the years I hear people pray differently. Some people say, Dear Heavenly Father. Some people say, Dear Lord. Some say, Our Gracious Heavenly Father. In other words and superlatives. Friend, it doesn't matter how you start your prayer. It reminds us of the one to whom you are praying. Now unto Him. The person to whom we're praying. Well then, <laughs> then it just gets, you know, some, you ever hear the expression, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. This is, like, this is true in life in so many ways, right? Years ago, when we first moved to Pennsylvania, this is Kentucky boy, hadn't really seen much snow by that point in his life. And uh, we moved in, in the summer, and that fall, we had, uh, the Lord had allowed us to purchase a little shack of a house. And we were, we'd got it fixed up living in it. And I remember the night, I'd gone on a basketball trip because I was coaching basketball, and I came home that night, and Becky had bought me two things. So number one, she bought me my very first snow shovel. <laughs> I'll never forget it. <laughs> it was a great day. The second thing she bought me was a suit jacket. Now listen, we were as broke as Job's turkey back in those days. We didn't enter ministry to, to get rich and famous or anything, so... Um, it was one of those things where the Lord had just provided a great bargain. It was a nice sport jacket. I mean, I've worked for a good while. And Becky was so proud of it, she just couldn't wait. Both things. And man, I was so excited for both of them. So, of course, I just, we, it was a road trip of a basketball game, and probably was kind of late. 
man, I, I put that coat on and I thought, man, this thing fits good. And I went to button it. There's no buttons on the thing. And Becky realized why she got it at such a good bargain. It didn't have buttons on it. Obviously, it's not too complicated of a situation, so we had some buttons sewn on it, and I wore it for a few years. But, you know, in this life, you, you, you hear that, you experience that. It sounds too good to be true, but it probably isn't. But let me tell you this promise here. It sounds too good to be true. But it's true. So, now unto Him. That's the person of prayer. Let's, let's just dig a little bit on this Number two, the possibility of prayer. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm not, um, this isn't prosperity gospel. This isn't name it, claim it kind of a thing. Um, this is just taking God for his word is what it is. We, we obviously, we, me, I obviously don't realize the possibility of prayer. Or I'd be doing a whole lot more of it. Maybe you don't realize the possibility of prayer. Or else you'd be doing a whole lot more praying. We lack a lot of faith when it comes to our prayer. But I think this verse reminds us, these, these superlatives that remind us, and it's pretty amazing. I like how Dr. John Phillips in his commentary kind of divided it up like this. He said, notice, so verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So think with me. This verse tells us that God is able to do all that we ask. What other person do you know on this whole earth that you can ask anything and they can, they're able to, or they are willing to do anything you ask? This is true of our God. He is able to do all that we ask. What are you asking for? Are you asking for peace in the midst of a storm in your life? Are you asking for help in an emergency situation? Are you asking for guidance for a decision? Are you asking for the salvation of a loved one? Are you asking for victory over sin? Are you asking God to bless the church? No matter what you ask, God is able to do it. But God is also able to do all that we ask or think. And this is where, this is where you know, I used the expression this morning, and I use it different times, about our sanctified imagination. To imagine what God could do. We all have thoughts that we, we maybe never express to other people. We all have dreams of the things that, oh, what God could do in our life. Oh, what God could do in the life of my children. Lord, I know you could do that if you, if you wanted to. And we'll think of great things of what God could do in the lives of our children. Well, God is able to do all that we ask or think. He sees our, He knows our heart. He knows our thoughts. and He's able to do all that we ask for. So, so look in this verse again because there's these words that I think encourage us. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all. God is able to do all that we ask for. Them. He's not limited us to just one request. Oh, nope. You passed your quota. That's it. No. He is able to do all that we ask of Him. Uh, John Phillips said, Surely God is delighted when our thoughts and prayers match His omnipotence. Then he illustrated, a man once uh, did Alexander the Great a service. And Alexander told him to ask for any type of reward that he wished. The man made such an enormous request that the imperial treasurer refused to pay it. So the man appealed to Alexander, and here's what Alexander supposedly said. This man knows the greatness of Alexander and has asked accordingly. He said, we are greatly honored. Grant his request. So, 
Let your prayers match God's omnipotence and His power. We learn in this verse that God is able to do another superlative above all that we ask. He doesn't just make minor improvements to our plans. No, He can take even the greatest of our plans and give them a magnificence that is worthy of Him. So He is able to do above all that we ask or think. He is able to do abundantly. I like that word too. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Only eternity will reveal how God has marvelously answered all of our prayers and even the ones that we thought He didn't answer. I think there'll be a lot of wonderful surprises for us when this life is over. and We see what God has done because God's power is inexhaustible. This is the possibility of prayer. Let's just apply these superlatives to our life. It would be easy for us to say, well, yeah, God would do that for Moses and the children of Israel. God would do that for Daniel. God would do that for all these people in the Bible. But let's apply these, this possibility of prayer to our life. I've referenced it, but what is it you pray for when it comes to your family? You have it son or daughter, young or old, it's lost, need to be saved. Maybe you have a son or daughter who's away from the Lord, grandson, granddaughter. What do you sit and dream of in relation to what God could do in the life of your family, your children, your grandchildren? I'll tell you right now, based on the authority of the Word of God, that God is able to do that. What is it you pray for when it comes to your business? You ever sit and dream about what God could do and how God could bless and what God could enable you to do for His kingdom? Well, can I remind you on the authority of the Word of God that God can do that? What about our church? Do you ever dream of what this church could be to this community? I hope you do. I wish you would. I got thinking about it this afternoon, 10 years ago from this moment. I don't know what day of the week it would have been on August the 27th. But 10 years ago right now, I was a, I'm still a rookie pastor, but I've been pastor for about five or six weeks at that point. We live here on the property. So in the daytime, even in the evening, I'd come into the auditorium, into the green auditorium. Some of you don't know what you're missing. We had green carpet. We had green padding and fabric on the pews. We had green carpet up here. We had green carpet up here. We had a green holy of holy veil up here. We had green trees, green. I mean, Kermit the Frog would have just loved it, right? Love being green. I used to come into this auditorium and just envision what could be. You know, 10 years ago, 30, 40, 50 people in this auditorium was a little pretty scarce. Even at this point, 10 years ago, Wednesday night services was across the hallway and that, that is classroom there. 10 or 15 of us would gather over there. Man, I was fired up. I was so excited. And I would just dream and envision, like, what could be? Fast forward to today, and I still come to this auditorium regularly. Now, except for you people who constantly change seats on me, I pretty much know where most of you sit. Some of you are nomads. One week on this side, one week on that side, one, one week, you know, back there. I mean, nobody too close to the front, but I still walk in here and I say, Lord, you know, what, 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 do you, what are your plans here, Father? 
and I'll, I'll dream. Now, I'll be honest, I, I, I've, I'm not the type that, uh, where, I, where I've dreamed of, of a specific number of attendants. Never, never made that a goal. Um, but I, I, still, I still come in here and I think, Lord, what, what, what is it you want us to do this community? What, what, could be, what could we do? What more could be done? It'd be real easy to be like, well, man, we, we're doing all right now. Let's just, you know, take a breath, enjoy it, and then just, you know, just try to maintain. Now's not the time to maintain. So, are we, I mean, we already out of room in the parking lot. What do we do? I, I don't know. I guess we build a parking garage. I don't know. Park in the grass. I don't know. You know. We don't have a whole lot of empty seats. Well, I mean, it'd just be awful if we had to go to two services. It'd be awful, wouldn't it? I mean, just terrible. You know, if we just, you know, just if, if, if uh, you know, we saw, we saw boys and girls and, their, and young families coming to church. Boy, that, I envision that. We started master clubs in a week and a half. And what I envision, what I'm believing that God will do is take that, that program and, and with the people who are helping that we will have a, just an impact and reach some young families, getting a whole new generation of young people into the church. I, I, I walk into the teen, what is the teen classroom? Several times a week. Pray for several things, you know, obviously. Praying that God will lead us to whoever He has for us for that. And, and pray that God would help us. I, I'm praying that God will make us run out of room in the gymnasium. You say, well, preacher, come on now. That costs money. I know, but I just I, wanna, I want to believe God for greater things. Has God lost His power? I mean, is He no, not capable of doing those things anymore? Now, honestly, I could care less about the, about the, num, this, the sheer numbers, but I'd sure like to reach a bunch of people for Jesus. So this, this verse encourages us on so many levels to, to pray, to dream of oh, what God could do. And believe it in faith. Knowing the possibility of prayer, we should start seeking the Lord for big prayers. Let's just, let's just see what He does. Let's, let's just see what... Let's just see. I don't think we can... We can put God to the test because He can't be tested. But I'd like, to, I'd like to believe and expect Him for greater things in our families, in our life, in your life. Because that is what, what this verse is teaching us about, the possibility of prayer. Oh, it's unimaginable. And let's close with this final thought of verse 20. We talk about the person to whom we pray, now unto Him, Biggest bulk of the verse teaches us about the possibility of prayer. And let's, let's consider what we find about the power of our prayer. The Bible says here in this verse, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh where? In us. In us. Thank God we... The, the power of our prayer. Thank God we have the presence of the power of God in our life in the person of the Holy Spirit. That, that power lives within. Our prayer is not based on our power. Because let's face it, we don't have any. Even if we did have power, it's not enough. Now let's turn to another prayer promise of 1 John chapter 5. Please. First John chapter five. According to the power that worketh in us. So this power is not our power. It's not according to how our ability or our 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 eloquence in our prayer. We find this truth and this promise in First John chapter five, verse fourteen. I encourage you to mark it. And this is the confidence that we have where? In Him. 
that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. This is the confidence that we have in him. Our confidence is not in our power, but in his power. There in Ephesians 3.20, when it says about the power that worketh in us, it's the Greek word dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite. It's the same that's used in Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And it simply describes God's unlimited power. God has shared that power with us. Church, it's time as as children of God, that we start living according to our privileges as God's children. We belong to the King who has unlimited power. And let's live according to our privileges. Let's let our prayer life get revitalized in the confidence that we have in this God to whom we are praying. Let's get prayer back as the lifeline of this church. Let's set aside time in our schedules for seasons of prayer, however long they might be. Five minutes, an hour. I made reference to it earlier that in that early church, they, they, didn't, have, they didn't have technology didn't have Facebook, no Instagram, no TikTok. They didn't have the ability to mass, to mass communicate. They couldn't send a text message. And yet that church shook the world because they knew how to pray. Not only did they know how to pray, they just prayed. See, we depend so much on, on our, our abilities and manpower, money and manpower. Every church wants money and manpower. Those things are important and necessary. Prayer is, we talk about money and manpower, prayer is unleashing God's power. And I'd much rather have that. This is the unimaginable power of prayer. So, don't stop praying for those needs that you've been praying for for years. Don't stop. Keep on praying. Believe God for greater things. Keep on praying. Keep on knocking on God's door, beseeching Him. And as a church, let's, let's do more than just know how to pray. Let's be a praying church. Let's pray together, maybe, please. Father, thank you for your word tonight. I pray, God, that in my own life, that you forgive me, Lord, for my prayerlessness. I'm ashamed, Father. Forgive us as a church for prayerlessness. Lord, for your glory, we... We look to you and what you could do in our lives and in our families and in this church. It's all for your glory. And help us, Father, to pray with this faith in possibility of what you could do. Thank you so much for the truth that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write. Thank you for the confidence that we have in you, Father. Now with their heads bowed, some of you have been praying for lost family, lost friends. You've been praying for wayward children. You've been praying for health needs. Let, let's, let's don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Just keep on praying because you There's nothing like the preaching of God's Word to bring comfort and conviction at the same time. I wonder, what will you do with what you've heard today? We would love to hear from you and pray with you. You may contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. 
That's enjoyingthejourney.org. I hope you'll be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church wherever you are this Lord's Day. And then join us as we continue our devotional study of the Word of God on enjoying the journey in the new week. May God bless you and thank you for listening.